Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a return guest this week. He has 25 years of age, a YouTube creator, a commentator, Twitch streamer, teacher. He was last on this show, episode 180, which we recorded on May 27th of last year, a bit more than a year ago. And man, has our guest, Levy Rosman's life changed. Last year at this <laughs> time, Levy had less than 2,000, excuse me, 10,000 YouTube subs. And as we discussed in that interview, he was doing a lot of other work aside from his content creation, his streaming, and his commentary, although he was already building a loyal audience. Now, as we record today, he has something like 1.6 million YouTube subs. This oh, is six. Oh, six. 1.06. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, you'll get there, but yeah, 1.06. Oh, this explosive growth puts him right at the top of the most popular chess YouTubers in the world. As of yesterday, Agad Mater had 1.13 million and Hikaru 1.03 million. Shout out to those two as well. But by the time this interview comes out, it seems likely that Levy will be the most popular chess YouTuber in the world. Either way, it's been quite a year for him. So rejoining us to reflect on his past year, his future, and yes, his recent return to competitive chess. I am Levy Rosman, Gotham Chess. Thank you for coming back, Levy. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I feel like you're... You're right up there with Bruce Buffer in terms of introductions. Like that, that was, uh, I'm hyped. I like, I want to go fight somebody. <laughs> like, I, I want to, you know, fist bump you and like, let's, let's get it on. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been crazy. But, but in fairness, I reached, I, I, I reached out to you. I wanted to talk because you have the best, uh, best, best chess podcast there is. So, it's been a crazy year, so I wanted to catch Thanks, up. Thanks, man. I, I really appreciate that, Levy. I'm glad you don't forget the little people. Um, obviously, I'm I'm happy with my station in life, but but the the following you've built has just been simply insane. And I, I want to talk about that. I mean, I can't imagine what your daily life has been like over the past year, but I think uh, we should be true to our brand, Levy, and start with the chess. So... Um, as we do this, you you just got back from Vegas about a week ago. You were mm -hmm. playing in this big tournament called the National Open. You did um, videos that got uh, huge numbers, as we'll talk about. But first, just tell me, Levy, like, how do you reflect on on that experience? On Vegas, um, yeah, it's it's really hard, man. Uh, it's really hard. I my entire chess career, uh, if if one can call it that, I. I loved winning and I, and I, and I loved learning new openings and, and putting them to the test. Uh, but I, I talked about this a lot on stream. I never thought that I would be even an international master. To me, that was the ultimate goal. I just thought grandmaster was this astronomical goal that I would never, I would never even get close to because career, college, whatever. I didn't know that I would necessarily be a chess creator. Uh, and when I hit the international master title, it was a massive adrenaline dump for me. And th that's how I describe it. Because over the next four tournaments, I lost maybe 50 rating points on K10. So for people that don't know, when you cross 2400, you hit the, your rating change factor goes down. So it's harder to gain and lose. And for me, it was definitely not that hard to lose. I just lost a ton of my rating. And I kind of said, okay, well, this is done. I'm not going to ever make this back. So uh, I, I never really tried because I just taught chess because that paid well because playing chess doesn't pay well at all. And uh, I taught chess and I thought maybe I would even have a career in finance or consulting, but coming back was interesting. And I think it was, it was obviously a completely different experience in the context of people coming up to me and introducing themselves and telling me they watch my content and, and all this kind of new element of having a permanent DGT board. <laughs> they just stationed me there on a board and, and, I, and I actually told them not to. That was the interesting thing. I did not request a permanent broadcasted board. Uh, but they actually had to convince me. They said it's good for publicity and everything. So it's a, a lot of mixed emotions. As far as the competitive chess aspect of it, uh, it's really hard. It's really hard to prep openings against people who have taken a year and a half off of the game, especially if they're young and they're underrated. And as you saw from my tweet, I had bloodshot eyes every night. I was so tired. I lost like three, four pounds over the course of the tournament. So Mixed emotions for sure, but hey, I'm, I'm I'm doing it again, doing it again in like a month. So 
I think I got I got the itch. <laughs> yeah. And for listeners, again, you should check out our first interview. I'm sure you could dig through Levy's reading some content and find some background info as well. But Levy talked about his pursuit of the IM title in our prior interview last year. And he said, he said in that interview, I quote the verbatim, I quote, I hate classical chess. And yep. it didn't sound like a pursuit of the GM title was, was imminent, but then, you know, it seems, sounds like you had a positive experience like Beatlemania there in, in Vegas and uh, shout out to the organizers for, for giving you a platform. I do think it's a good idea on, on their part. Now, Levy, you mentioned you're playing again in a month. So where are you going? Uh, I will leak that when it's closer to the date. So I actually okay. have just for concerns of cr just crowd control and everything. I even reached out to where I'll be playing and well, I'll probably just DM it to you in about a minute, but uh, or, or a minute after we finish talking, but, uh, I, I it, it's hard because I, I don't know what it's going to be like. At least Las Vegas was spaced out. It was a bit more of the casino feel. It was a big tournament. There was, and I could basically go to the playing hall talk to some people on the way back to the elevator and just hang out in my room. But, the, you know, where, where I'll play, if it's a small and close setting, there's nowhere to go, really. So you got to you, – you, this is just the stuff I have to think about now. Uh, yeah. So I, I never I never take it for granted. I, I don't think it's it's a bad thing, but it, these are just sort of, sort of the concerns. I think there is a, a really nice element to the fact that the games are broadcast, that people are following along, and then they get to hear not just the moves and the analysis, but – my emotion afterward, which there's a lot of over the course of four or five hour games. And I still hate classical chess, but I really like to gain rating. <laughs> and this is the trade off, sadly. Yeah. And we should say Levy had a pretty good showing. You beat uh, Young Phenom, Christopher Yu, um, only lost to Grandmasters. And I think a lot of people listening or watching, listening to or watching this will have seen your recap videos, being that they got like 400,000 views was... uh, per recap. But anyone listening who hasn't, I definitely recommend you you check it out. You you get the whole full spectrum of the emotion of a classical chess tournament. And, you know, as you refer to with the bloodshot eyes and, and the exhaustion, you know, seeing you on Twitter and then I caught up with your videos later, if you hadn't tweeted out, like, I'm going to begin training again um, and continue to play, I wouldn't have guessed it just based on, like, reading the emotions of the tournament. Yeah, people were definitely pretty right, uh, pretty correct in saying that you'll take a little bit of time and reflect. And uh, I definitely, like you said, the support of the community, they were the best performing videos I've put out probably ever. There was obviously this this cheater and charity thing, and that got a lot of attention. But all Could of those recaps. That? Yeah, yeah, well, there was the the, the charity with um, that, that Anand did. The charity event. The oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that, that's what event. Yeah. Yeah, so like that was oh, chess drama. That got a lot of views, but then these recaps just absolutely obliterated all of my previous records. And it was kind of depressing coming back here and launching videos into a hurricane because I knew they were not going to perform as well. And on YouTube, you get this performance indicator. And if you're not performing as well as the other 10, it gives you this big fat gray arrow that you're below average and... Uh, anytime you have a video that's number one or number two out of 10 in terms of view count in, in a certain time frame, it'll give you fireworks or this big green arrow and it's this dopamine effect. So, uh, <laughs> I've been firing videos off that are not performing anywhere near as well. And I kind of want those Vegas videos to get pushed out of my most recent 10 so that I can, I can finally feel normal about my view count. But I have to say, uh, I was averaging about 1.2, 1.3 million over 48 hours and Vegas got up to 2.3. So just a million more views in 48 hours, which is nuts. It's crazy yeah. how invested people were and I appreciate it. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's awesome to see. And again, I find the videos quite compelling. I've been a fan of that format for a while, but dating back to when I am Kostya Kavutsky used to do them in tournaments. I've talked with John Bartholomew. I think it's, um, it's very compelling uh, because you you feel the emotion, but nonetheless, the numbers are just like off the charts to me. Just because you, I mean, you're a super strong player, even though you're you're modest, so you can't go over. I mean, you do a good job explaining sort of more advanced concepts to a wider audience, but still, like when you're playing a grandmaster, that's advanced stuff. So. I don't know if there are 400,000 tournament chess players in the world, you know, and there, there everyone is tuning in. 
Um, but I don't want to step on my first Patreon question. So before we dig deeper into Vegas, I just want to hop right into it um, because mm -hmm. uh, one of your many fans who was um, sort of uh, really impressed with these videos wrote in. So for, for listeners who aren't familiar, uh, supporters of Perpetual Chess find out the guests in advance and are able to submit questions from them for them. Excuse me. Uh, so this one is from Derek Jones. Thanks for the support, Derek. And Derek says, uh, your tournament recaps have been amazingly entertaining, but your mid-tournament recaps of your own games from the National Open were the most compelling chess content I've ever seen. Watching you reveal what you were thinking during the games made it feel like I was right there with you. The best part was how human it felt. It wasn't just a regurgitation of engine analysis. Since this is supposed to be a question, I'll ask you this. Was it difficult being so vulnerable after your game performances while you were still in the middle of the tournament? Did publicly airing your mistakes and thinking errors for the games you lost make it harder to get into a competitive frame of mind for your next games? Uh, so I did. I did see this question. You did. Uh, you did. You did show it to me. I, I try not to prepare answers too much. I like to get it kind of fresh. Uh, so I appreciate the question. Thank you for supporting Ben. You definitely should. Uh, and. Uh, so first of all, no, I, as much as I have a Twitch persona and I trash talk and I say things that if you just read it, you're like, wow, this guy is, I mean, he is so full of himself. No, I, I actually, I, I get humbled very often in, in competitive settings and I, I have really no problem talking about it. I, I, like, I have no problem talking about many other things that might <laughs> people might feel insecure about or people think that you you shouldn't discuss this you should kind of do I, I like to I like to like mental health issues and, and and things of that nature so no uh i enjoyed uh telling people my best moments and my my worst moments and the emotions that i felt during the game doubt or or, or whatever it might be I mean, there's a whole wide range of emotions during a chess game so no uh i i enjoyed it a lot and just like you know, this viewer question, people found it some, to be some of the most compelling chess content they've ever watched because they actually care about the person who's playing the game. The, the super grandmasters, they also might care about, but because they've maybe watched so many hours of content and I've kind of been the, the mentor along their chess journey, they, 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 they're rooting for me in a, your favorite basketball player or your favorite tennis player sort of way or football player, uh, soccer football, but also fine, American football. I'm sure we have people who uh who prefer the nfl so uh i now now the competitive frame of mind is interesting so i th for the first time in my life i'm actually going to seriously consider and i'm probably going to talk to a sports psychologist just to see what that's like I, i've heard that a lot i've heard different athletes do it i definitely need it because I, I i'm not myself when i play stronger opposition and i'm not really afraid to admit that uh and and some some games it goes away. Some games I like against Chris Yu, except for that one idiotic blunder when I got really excited. I thought I had a winning combination. I almost played the game of my life because I was just really firing in all cylinders. However, I was still playing moves really slowly. So I was playing all the best moves, but I was really doubtful that they were the best moves. But then you come home and you know your Stockfish 13 is like, yeah, yeah, best move. Go, 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 play it, play it, play it. Uh so yeah, I, I I haven't evolved to a to a to a level of of I think mature enough uh, state of mind or competitive framework that is necessary to probably excel at the highest level. I would not be surprised if some of the super GMs in the world have just it's just a mindset thing, or some of the best best athletes in the world's just a mindset thing. Because I'm not an athlete. I'm just, I'm not. I've never as much as. I want to say that, you, or you can argue that becoming an international master, you have to train like an athlete. No, you just need some good opening prep. That's it. Like <laughs> I gained 150 points on good opening prep and 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 good dynamic uh, skill set and instinct. So, but to get to GM, I think uh, for myself personally, that that is one step that I will definitely need to take. Uh, but yeah, as far as recapping my games and everything, it's it's a it's a pleasure. It's an honor to do it for people, and uh, people love it. So I'm gonna keep doing it. That's that's awesome. That's I can't wait to see how this sort of story unfolds because I have a feeling it might get even bigger. I mean, your channel's consistently growing. Um, you you know, uh, people are going to tell their friends about it, and you know, I shared it with a friend, chess chess fan friend who hadn't watched it and was just like, "Wow, that's so compelling." Um, and 
you know, not, not to not to blow smoke up your ass or whatever, but that that's just what he said, and that's sort of how I felt. And again, I feel that way about other game recaps as well. I saw Eric Rosen post your buddy Eric Rosen mm-hmm. posted one yesterday, friend of the pod as well, and I need to catch up on on his. Um, so there's also the energy management question, Levy. I mean, you you mentioned again seeing a sports psychologist, and I know you you battled some time trouble demons. Uh, for listeners who don't know, time trouble basically means you get a set amount of time in a given game. And uh, if you think too much, you suddenly have to play very fast. Now, Levy's good at playing fast, but uh, if you're playing, a, you know, you can't outplay a grandmaster with one minute um, and they have an hour unless possibly you're Alexander Grishuk. Um, so was it hard to do the videos in terms of like you could be prepping for your opponent? You know, there's an opportunity cost there in terms of possibly your performance and like you could be resting but obviously with the views, I mean, it's it's kind of comes with the territory. But was it was it hard to make the time to do them? No, not at all. So uh, Vegas was well spaced out. It was a good time control. It's very important. Uh, also, it's American chess. So pairings come out 40 minutes before your next round. Uh, and I, I don't want to knock on the Vegas organizers. They by far have a, probably a top five open tournament that's 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 run in the United States. As long as it's not a super closed event, those are obviously going to be a little bit better. But uh, I'm just going to say this right now. Um, and this is not to deter anybody from playing in chess tournaments. By all means, do go ahead and play in chess tournaments. You will have a good time. American chess tournaments are garbage compared to Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, they are, especially in the open section. So they are two games a day, which is absolutely brutal, and everybody complains about that. Uh, many of them, particularly, let's just not name names, but um, you, some of them you have to bring your own chess set. Yeah, It is it is unheard of, and, and that is not elitism. It is just it is unheard of in any other part of the world that a title player needs to bring a board in pieces and set it up. Like, why is that not there? I played in the Czech Open in Pardubica, in a hockey arena, okay? And they had 100 DGT boards. And for people who don't know what those are, those are expensive broadcast boards on which games are played and relayed to the internet. They had 100 live games and many more chess sets. Everything was provided from the highest section to the lowest section. An unrated beginner could show up and play. And that obviously has to do with sponsors, local funding, the local you know, municipal- municipality helps the tournament. States just don't have that. And... That's unfortunately what, what it's like. So uh, in Europe, I would get my next opponent. And there's also one game every day. So you can maximize your sleep, living experience. Uh, I would get my pairing and have 18 hours, which is also not great, by the way, because you ruminate about what you want to play for 18 hours. But uh, yeah, in, in, in these tournaments, I know that I'm going to get my next opponent with 40 minutes before the round. So what am I going to prepare? I mean, am I going to refute their opening repertoire? No. I have to choose what I'm going to play. I have to review some lines, and that's it. So, no, I had plenty of time. I, I usually would come back to the room, rest, make my recap, uh, order some gross delivery because the food <laughs> options were terrible, which is another problem of tournaments here. There are usually not a lot of food options around. Uh, and power nap or lay in bed and look at basketball news for like 90 minutes. Uh, so, No. I, I don't think, and I would I would never trade it at the end of the day. I think by profession, I'm now a content creator. So how can I not make content, right? So uh, yeah, I think that's the best answer I can give you. Nice. It should should be interesting to track going forward. Now let's let's dig a little bit more into your chess game, Levy. So you mentioned the Grandmaster title uh, mm-hmm. in the pa- in the past. You've you've kind of like in our previous interview, you said you felt lucky to get IM, which again, given your your blitz ratings and you know. Your, your ability to calculate and stuff. I think you're selling, you know, you're being modest or falsely modest there, but, <laughs> but GM title, obviously that's, that's a, a whole different animal. So are, are you going to pursue that title or is it more just sort of, you're going to train and you're going to play and you'll see what happens. Very tough to say. So I wanted to take it a tournament at a time and just generally get better. I wanted to actually get to a point where I can, uh, I don't have to use those last 40 minutes before a game to prep. I can just review my opponent's openings and go, okay, well, this is what's in my arsenal. And uh, this is what I'm going to trot out. Because the way it is now, it's kind of a mad dash. What do I play? What do I play? I know a little bit about everything, but I just want to be confident and have the the skills to just show up and and play. And that's what a lot of grandmasters do, frankly. They know that you're going to be preparing. They, they understand all of that. And they have the skill set to, first of all, 
avoid your preparation or play into it a little bit and then deviate and then outplay you. Uh, I, but there's a second element to this, and this kind of goes along with the sports psychology element is that I need to start actually not being uh, so self deprecating and joking mm-hmm. that I will never get the title. And I, and I actually think you, uh, you manifest it. I, I, I think it's a reality. I haven't actually started on this process of manifesting. I haven't, uh, I haven't done a tremendous amount of research, but I, I am sure that if you walk around with the confidence and the ability, and I'd say this to lower rated players all the time, if you want to be a rating, you can't respect that rating or fear it. You, you're going to be it. So you can't be afraid of it. I have to start doing that myself. But as I always say, do as I say, not as I do. It's uh, It's been pretty hard. Uh, but like I said, I have those games where I'm full of confidence and the title means nothing. The rating of my opponent means nothing. And I, I build up the confidence, but uh, it, it's nowhere near as consistent as it has to be. So we'll see. But it would be very nice to get the GM title. And I probably should stop saying things like I will never be one because that's stupid. If why am I coming back to play tournaments? If I'm also saying stuff like that. All right. There you have it. That's fun to hear. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've interviewed a few people chasing the GM title to me. I mean, you guys are so strong to begin with, but I love to see, I love to see people, uh, you know, trying to achieve their maximum. Um, so you mentioned in one of your YouTube videos that you reached out to your former and possibly again coach GM Vojtech Miranda, who of course uh, you did a fun, I think it was a guest the Elo video featuring his great book, and he's been on the podcast. So you might you might do some work with Vojtech, and then you alluded to some sort of uh, secret potential coaches. Can you reveal anything else about that, Levy? Yes. So uh, I had a grandmaster reach out and be like, "Hey, you know, I saw you're coming back for the Vegas tournament." uh would be interested in helping you it's uh it's not like magnus or a niche or one of these guys uh but uh, that would actually be interesting a super yeah. gm coaching pairing uh and we we actually haven't gotten anything scheduled yet because it's just it's just 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 the way it works hey you know can you do tomorrow uh no right. can you do the day after etc but uh i i definitely have some report with uh i, I always say report like richard report but it's like rapport yeah, I have some uh, rapport with uh, with Wojciech. We we we've worked together. He's uh, also been a, a super instrumental in helping one of my closest friends, Kyron Griffith, get his I am I want to say title. He's about twenty three ninety six with three norms. So let's just say he's going to get the title. He just popped off in Vegas, had a monster event, and it's they they worked together for for some time. So that also was part of the motivation. And yeah, Wojciech's great. Uh, he's very. He's very on the nose. I'll tell him I want to play a line. He'll tell me it's garbage. I'll say I want to keep playing it. He'll say, all right, you do you. Um, and he kind of, he, he tells it like it is and he's got a good style. And uh, that's, that. yeah, that's that's part of the training plan to come back. But uh, a lot of it is going to be, a lot is going to be me. I, I have to sit down and, and do the work myself. It's, it's not like you come in every day to the mixed martial arts gym and you have five different coaches. Uh, I think I, I need one or two max uh, and I, I've got to really put in a, a, a good effort myself, which which is really not easy. I have to tell you between the streaming schedule and yeah. I, you know I want to make two YouTube videos a day, and I want to improve my courses or work on the website a little bit, and and, and it's just I want to go to the gym and don't neglect that's another your girlfriend. <laughs> yes, yes. Lu- I mean, Lucy's the backbone of everything that I do. So I, I she's out. She probably heard me just say that. Love you, honey. Um, so it's <laughs> yeah, uh, Lucy. It's it, it it's nuts, man. I, but some days it's eight nine p.m. I haven't had time to do any chess study, and I'm exhausted. I'm falling asleep trying to trying to learn my lines. So yeah, there's got there's going to be sacrifices made, and I have to figure out which sacrifices I have to make. Yeah, I was going to say because obviously, like you've you've had a lot of success in this past year. Like you you could take your foot off the gas and focus on on training even more if uh, if you wanted to. Not saying you should. I certainly don't. But but it's a possibility. I I have I've definitely taken I mean June I streamed maybe thirty hours it's really it really hasn't been a lot between Vegas and preparing for Vegas and just burnt I was burnt out I I like officially whatever burnout felt like I I felt like I had it and it felt like if I didn't stop I was 
you know, I, I, I talked about it also. Like I said, I'm very open about this stuff. I was just laying in bed and I had no desire to do anything, much less make YouTube videos. YouTube, I can still get up for because I can just record it, put it out, put some tags on it, monetize it and be done with it. But streaming takes a lot out of you because it's a lot of interaction for many hours at a time. And yeah, I just, I, I had no desire to do much of anything. So I just kind of made a YouTube video a day and tried to take some walks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you mentioned this on Twitter and you alluded to sort of mental health. Um, I don't know if I would call them challenges, but whatever, like everyone has, has mental, has ups mm -hmm. and downs. Um, so I think it's good that you're open about that. I mean, it really drives home. Like everyone from the outside has got to be just marveling at, at the year that you've had, but it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily change one's mindset. Is that, has that been your experience, Levy? Mindset in terms of like, like who I am your as a overall person, mood. Or, oh, uh, I don't know. My 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 over. I mean, I'm probably happy more than anything else, right? Uh, I'm I'm pretty competitive. So I when I first started this journey, I I did have the goal. I I, I was really tracking every day how far I was a, away from being number one on YouTube. I'm not gonna lie. Even when I had like 150, 200 thousand subs. Uh, it's interesting, you know, that mindset I applied to, to to growing my YouTube channel, I should probably apply to my my competitive chess. I just had this realization because even when I was number 15 on YouTube, I always believed I could become the best. And I and I kept looking for ways that there wasn't enough content available for beginners. And I, I, I timed a lot of things correctly, admittedly, on this journey with the Queen's Gambit and more viewing audience that was going to come in and they, pointing them in the right direction and giving them content that was not available on YouTube. So I would say I, I, I made a lot of good decisions and worked as hard as possible right when opportunity knocked, like with the Queen's Gambit. So, uh, but I think, yeah, inherently being competitive and, 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 and happy more than anything else. But yeah, certainly there's days that I'm just totally spent. I stream or do commentary and then immediately make the recap and of, of one of these top tournaments and by the end of it it's 8 p.m and i haven't eaten a meal so <laughs> wow uh but uh but no i mean i i always crack up when i get somebody reaches out because they want to talk to me let like let's say for a journal or or some interview and they say i want to be respectful of your time I'm like come on i'm a streamer what what uh, i'm not a elected official that needs to go out into communities and actually make legitimate change like let's let let's let's not let's not give me too much credit. I'm not some sort of you know I, I'm a guy who sits in front of two monitors and talks to a camera. Uh, so that always cracks me up as if I have to be regarded with some degree of respect. Uh, but uh, definitely, it's a it's a mix of a few different things like happiness. Still, I'm I'm competitive and I and I want to push the bar and I want to push chess to new audiences constantly and take on new projects and. Uh, I'm very tired. Recently, not as much. I've been trying to get out more. I'm get, getting more physically fit, signed up for the gym. I, 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 I travel pretty far to work out with a friend of mine, Alex Ostrovsky, because uh, he's been going to the gym for about nine months and has done good things for him. And uh, I've made that effort. But I don't think fundamentally as a person I've changed at all. <laughs> I think I'm still the same uh, sarcastic brat. But if you kind of get, you know, if you if you get to know me, I'm I'm a nice dude. Could grab a drink with me, uh, and uh, I, I don't think that's changed actually in in, in the past year. Or so, uh, growth, income, whatever it might be, it's I'm 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 really still kind of the same person, for better or for worse. <laughs> but, yeah, that's true. For better or for worse, yes. <laughs> no, but I mean, what you say about like you know, it's not that much trouble for you to do interviews or whatever. I mean, certainly, like you say that, but obviously, like something like me interviewing you, there's more in it for me than for you at this stage. So it's still appreciated, but Levy, and I do want to get into what you're alluding to in content creation, but just one more thing on sort of the, the chess topic. I mean, you've mentioned, so we've discussed now tra training for the GM title and more generally just to like a pursuit of improvement, even if it's not about the sort of uh, accolade of the GM title. Um, and you alluded to sort of needing a wider repertoire, especially when you're playing these, uh, these GMs. But is there anything else specifically you would be training? What what do you feel like you need to improve at? So, uh, coach and I agree on this. Uh, it's not rocket science. I think at this day and age, to 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 get a competitive advantage, particularly with what I'm doing, I don't have a ton of hours to dedicate to my improvement. 
my most uh, thorough advantage would be an opening preparation. Uh, that might not necessarily mean getting an advantage because frankly, there are very few advantages left to gain. There's novelties that can complicate the position and make it trappy for the opponent, make it very difficult for them to, 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 to play through. And that's actually how I got most of my norms. Uh, preparation that would lead my opponent into many different complicated areas and one of my the best wins of my life, which I regrettably have on an old laptop that's dead now and I can't ever make a YouTube video on, is uh, one of my opponents misplaying on like move 13, 14 of a very complex line and I have to refute it over the board. And I did. And I won the game and that was one of the best GM wins I ever I ever had. And it clinched in my first I am norm for me, I think, in the World Open. So uh, the repertoire is super important. Uh, also what kind of lines you play, like you need to be layered. For example, drawish lines with black, I cannot play for a win against lower rated players. But if I'm playing a closed tournament where everybody's around the same level and I know how many points I need to get a norm or gain a certain amount of points, why not? I can play zero risk lines with black. And if I draw, I draw, it's not a big deal. But if I'm playing a 2100 in Vegas, I got to win. I mean, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but I have to win the game. So there's no way for me to play that. So you need layers of your repertoire. Um, beyond that, for, for me personally, I, I understand you can train positional play and strategic play and, and dynamic play. So I'm going to tout my, uh, to my own horn here for a second. Wojciech once famously told me that of all the people he's ever trained, I have the best sense of dynamics. So I, I, I'm a fiend for dynamic play. I'm always looking for it. And that's my own worst enemy because I'll look for it in a position that it doesn't exist particularly against grandmasters and I'll go for it after spending 30 minutes they'll spend five refute me completely I lose the game and I go oh shucks <laughs> uh and Vegas was actually not much you know m much off from that I I kind of went from variations that I thought were good they were not and every now and then I'll out calculate a stronger opponent and surprise them because I kind of see the board in a certain way but uh a lot of it I think comes to s stopping myself like, don't do that thing that you're about to do, and here's why. Uh, and be a little bit sharper with your with your practical decision making, rather okay. than uh, uncorking a seven move checkmating combination. A lot of a lot of games against stronger players really comes down to okay. There's a couple of critical moments in this game that transform the position in a certain way, and you must evaluate it and decide which one is best. And, it, and listen, I got to tell you, I had a decent tournament in Vegas, but I didn't do that very well. Uh, there were some games, even against some of the lower rated players, that they could have they could have capitalized on some of my inaccuracies, and that's just chess. They didn't because statistically, being a lower rated player, they won't. They're, the the final mistake will most likely be made by them, and that is what ultimately ended up happening. But there were definitely moments in Vegas where it came to that critical moment, and I was wrong but I was bailed out by the fact that I'm the stronger player. And ultimately I could capitalize on their inaccuracies, but it did not happen against the GMs. <laughs> they were sharper for a longer period and more sustained period of time. Uh, even in end games, like my end game against the Capian, which was like five and a half hours. I thought it was over. I thought it was completely over for the last 20 moves. And it wasn't at all. There was still plenty of fight, but I had given up on the position. So endurance and practical decision-making, I think is how I can, get better but that's a very abstract way ultimately it comes down to execution i think okay i mean honestly though i feel like that might be easier than just getting better at calculating which again as you allude to like you just watching you play one minute like in the i am not a gm stuff uh, <laughs> you know you're, you're very uh resourceful um i yeah it's it's fun for me i i think that's that that skill alone gives me the confidence that i can i can probably get that g in in my title awesome well Fun story to track along with the uh, Levy mania as you uh, gallivant <laughs> around the U.S. But Levy, we want to get more into your content creation. But first, uh, let's take a break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to quiz you and make sure that you remember whatever tactical patterns or opening sequences that you're working on. They have a huge catalog of great 
books from top flight authors, both for purchase. And if you check for their short and sweet courses, you can find tons of free content. Speaking of free content, Chessable, of course, has also recently launched an adult improvement focused chess podcast called How to Chess with yours truly hosting it. Check for it on Chessable's YouTube channel, and you can also subscribe on the podcast platforms. So, Levy, we got to get into it. Um, Obviously, becoming the biggest uh, YouTube presenter in in the world. um, And it all all happened, really, in the past 13 months. So, Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were a series of moments, Levy, but do you recall any in particular where you were just like, uh, for for lack of a better way to put it, like, holy crap, what's happening here as you wake up and check your analytics? Yes. So... I can, this is really the origin story of the YouTube channel. Uh, I had it, it was there. And I started all uh, on YouTube, like in 2019, just making what I thought was going to be a really cool series. And maybe I'll bring it back. And you might remember this, the postmortem. And so in chess, uh, the postmortem is a period where you analyze the game after it's over. But if you type in postmortem to YouTube and you do it incorrectly, you'll get death videos, like videos of people <laughs> after, you know, and then and, and, and like the person who, yeah, it's it's really weird. And I, I had to remove that hashtag. But uh, it was supposed to be kind of a sports center of chess news. And I was going to have segments of Prodigy Watch, the drama. But there wasn't enough in a seven day span, frankly, even in a 14 day span, like chess is really hot and there could be drama and there have been some pretty dramatic periods of time, uh, definitely. But I ended up tabling that and I was still a chess teacher in May, 2020, but I took a walk to a Thai restaurant. I went to get my lunch and I was walking. I'm like, how do I start a YouTube channel? I said, okay, I'm going to reset my rating and play games and and go go from like 1,000 to 2,200. And I said, I'm going to call it the Gotham Guide because that's so brilliant. Both words start with the letter G. Wow, I'm so smart. And I did it and I recorded them on Twitch and I put them up on, on YouTube and I put on my chess teacher hat and people enjoyed them and they got some views. Uh, then tournaments started happening, these online events. And I said, hey, I'm going to make some recaps of the most interesting games. And I, and I put them out and some of them got some views. And uh, I spoke to Eric Rosen. He, he talked to me about YouTube and he said, hey, don't put the same thumbnail twice. I said, yeah, I was too lazy to, uh, you know, I didn't, have a, I didn't have a thumbnail person. So I said, I just put the same one twice. I said, don't do that. That's bad for the algorithm. And he gave me a lot of pointers back when he was on the climb to 100K or maybe it was 50K back then. I don't remember, but he, he's one of my closest friends. So uh, particularly in the chess world, uh, I, I, I would say so. And I just kind of was consistent. Anything I did on Twitch, I would put on YouTube. So four player chess, uh, even the, the, just the worst videos imaginable, uh, from these online events that just did not have a great quality. And then I, then I did basic chess openings explained, which is just an abomination of a video compared to stuff that I do now, but it has a million views. It's crazy. Like people just wanted bite-sized chess content. And that is when I started this journey of what can I give people in bite-sized format? The 10 minute chess opening series is a hit that people just want to learn the basics of an opening in 10 minutes or less. Um, This is June, July. Then I moved here and I started making those day recaps. You know, my man Antonio always makes the solo games, but, and he will make a few in a day. Uh, I'd like to think that he makes three or four a day now because he's got stiff competition. This is um, Agamathur, of course. For Yes, Antonio, yeah, yeah uh, Agamathur. So uh, I don't know, maybe he used to do three or four in a day, but I, I, I love that. Like, you know, he'll, he'll make one every hour. That's awesome. Um, I, I try to not do that just because I think the YouTube algorithm prefers if you space it out by eight hours, but nobody actually knows what the YouTube algorithm uh, gods say or do. <laughs> uh, but... You know, he does the solo games and I said, okay, I'm going to take the whole day and wait for the games to end, which is good and bad because there's already games being published. And I'm going to make a recap of the most interesting games uh, with a fun thumbnail. And I, I don't think I'm missing any steps, really. This is sort of the journey it took. And then the Queen's Gambit started coming out, like the trailer. And this is when I fr- had my first aha moment. So my Queen's Gambit video got a sp- uptick in views. And that happened because the trailer would lead to a recommended video that said, 
how to play the Queen's Gambit, Gotham Chess. You know, it would pop up in the sidebar when people watched the Queen's Gambit trailer. People would click it. And it had 100,000 views in whatever time span it had. And then all of a sudden it got 10K in a day, 20K in, in, in a day. I was like, what is going on here? That's when I realized the Queen's Gambit was no joke. And basically I dedicated all my content from that point forward to this new wave of audience that was going to come in. And I made how to play chess, not a five minute video like a lot is on YouTube, but a 30 minute video. And I was going to call it the ultimate beginner guide. It was going to give people peace movements, interactions, check and checkmate. And after they were done, they would be curious about the game. Uh, I kept doing the recaps and I just, I, I, I added on layer by layer uh, how to solve chess tactics and exercises and slowly the view count grew and grew. And I think it got to its maximum point around December, January, when the full Queen's Gambit effect had taken place. And I, I said this in a recent uh, interview, I think with um, with BBC it was, but I went from about 100K, 120K in 48 hours to 2 million, like 2.2 million, 2.1 million, because just from uh, this. Views on a specific video or? Overall. Okay. Overall. And, and, and what I learned is that there was also a period of time I went from one video a day to two. So one at 7 a.m., one at 7 p.m. on anything, any subject. And uh, I, I, just, I, I just worked really hard. And I, I was also streaming. So I would stream 100 hours a month, 120, 30 hours a month. And I made the beginner boot camp, which, listen, I'm a firm believer in the fact that you can, you can source free chess content. Uh, and I, I'm a firm believer in the fact, like I go to the gym and I don't have a personal trainer, but as I always say, if you have the funds in place and you want to get that chess.com premium membership and this access to, you know, a portal of, of, of chess teachers who make this content for you, structured lessons, uh, or you want to buy a boot camp, which will tell you all the phases of the game, game reviews. I play some of my viewers there and I analyze and. Like if you can and you want to get it, it, it will improve your chess. Yes, you can do it for, for free, but sometimes that's very scattered and all over the place. And if you just want a solution where you pay and it's all right there for you, by all means do it. And uh, the rest is kind of history. I've been doing the exact same thing ever since. Uh, recently, that's expanded to music. <laughs> my, your rap my, career, yeah. Yeah, my my rap and and series like Guess the Elo, uh, which has been just an unbelievable sensation, and I and I credit that to a couple of different comments over videos over time. But um, I don't think I'm really missing anything. You know, it's a mix of uh, openings videos and Gambit videos and and Guess the Elo and the tournament recaps. And every now and then, I'll, I'll I started doing a bunch of chess history. People say that uh, their favorite video I've ever made was Kaspar versus the World. It was like a thirty minute mini documentary on the entire thing and the thought process behind every move. And, um, that's sort of been it, man. I, I, that's, that's it. I worked really, really hard and I think uh, hard work met opportunity and it sort of just exploded. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you make it sound not that hard, but obviously you, the YouTube, uh, the YouTube chess streets are fierce. There's lots of people making content. Um, I mean, and I, I do find your videos to be quite compelling. So, I mean, I, I think I told you, even in our last interview, like I, even though you were, you already had a bigger audience than me, I still felt like you should be bigger. And obviously uh, <laughs> that has uh, borne out over the past year. Um, so is your plan going forward, Levy, just sort of like more of the same? Do you have any, anything new in the works? Definitely more of the same. I'm still not number one. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to, I'd like to become number one. That's always been, like I said, I, I, I so I'm internally very competitive uh, on this whole thing. I, I really wanted to be to 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 be the biggest uh, and and attract the most audience. And I think that there is a bit of, of an advantage to being in the states versus being, for example, in Europe. Like uh, YouTube ad policy, I think, is significantly more friendly in the states. Uh, it's much easier to make a career out of it. For example, full time. Uh, and 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 that 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 is obviously one nice thing. Despite living in New York City, which takes which ultimately ends up taking half my money, after it's all said and done. Uh, so I think there there's definitely some benefits associated with being a creator on YouTube um, in the states and and having 
For example, uh, athletes and celebrities who are based here playing chess or tweeting about chess or tweeting about the Queen's Gambit. It doesn't matter if a person with 10 million followers goes, I just watched the Queen's Gambit. That is massive. I mean, that is so big. Anything chess related uh, will, will, will help us. And I have a lot of respect for the OGs. And I am by no means... I'm a firm believer in the fact that you can build somebody up without taking away from anybody else. So when people say, oh, I watch Gotham and I hate these other people, I'm like, why, why, why are you like that? Like, why? I, when I carved out this area on YouTube, my entire logic was a little bit of that. It was that everyone's got a, a little bit missing. Something's missing from every, everyone. And I feel like I can be that channel for people. And it's proven true for a lot of people, but a lot of people also don't enjoy my content because they like the calm demeanor or the more thorough analysis, particularly some of the stronger players, you know, the 1900s, 2000s. But if you're 1900 and 2000 and you don't enjoy my content because it's more tailored for an audience that's maybe 1500 below, 1200 and below, I mean, there's no need to like tear me apart. You could just go enjoy the content that that you like, right? So it, it, it goes both ways. People say, I love Gotham and I hate all these other people. But you don't need to do that. You know, Gotham is better than all these people for X, Y, and Z, or these people are better... But obviously that's going to happen as people b build fan bases and whatnot. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for the people that were doing this when the opportunity necessarily wasn't there. And I do kind of think sometimes like, sure, I bring in a lot of viewers, but does this disperse? Do people start with me and then go to those other people to maybe fill in the gaps like a Hanging Pawns, for example, who does really thorough videos on opening prep? I think the answer is yes. I think that if I, I am the intro to people, for chess on YouTube, they're like, wow, this is pretty interesting. You know, it's not like boring. They all like, oh, this guy's engaging. He's, he kind of acts like a clown sometimes. He's funny. Chess is interesting. Let me hang out here. His comment section is a bunch of memes. Like, let me, you know, like we have the biggest engagement sometimes on my channel, like thousands of comments on a video, just people joking around and having a good time. And then they disperse to the other smaller channels. That is the ultimate goal for me. But I don't know. I also don't know. Maybe if people spend an hour a day on YouTube, they only watch me. They don't watch the other people. So this is something that I'm thinking about and maybe in the future we'll do something to just boost up the smaller channels that were definitely there before me for example i did get a really funny comment recently so you know mato mato yelich was a one yeah. of the youtube ogs yeah so i got a comment on one of my videos that said this was so funny uh mato yelich uh taught us without a with just the board because he doesn't have an ego you have an ego because you have a face cam i was like man yeah, well like that is good that's that's going to be a tough person to convince no matter what. I, I, I'm i a YouTuber with a face camera, so I have an ego. I, I can't please everybody, Ben. Um, yeah. Well, I saw so. you on stream one time say you have a bit of Kevin Durant in you and reading the comments. So, I mean, obviously at, at your level, if you, and for, for listeners who don't know, Kevin Durant, obviously one of the most famous basketball players in the world, but he had a controversy where he had a secret uh, social media account where he was like responding to haters. Um, so, but I, yeah, I mean, that could, that could be a full-time job for you if you got caught up in it. I totally. And yes, for those that don't know, I used to pin hate comments on my YouTube videos. Um, it's very difficult to do now because people have realized that I do it. So people realize that I, I pin hate comments, so it's very difficult to identify who's actually a troll and who's hating. If I see someone has 50 comments on my channel and that one was very inflammatory, I know that they're just trying to get pinned, but I'll have a person who's commented three times and all of them are hateful, but they're spread out over three months. Like, why do you keep coming back if you don't like it here? <laughs> what, what are <laughs> right. you doing? Um, so yeah. that, that's one, you know, that's, that's one way to get engagement uh, that, that, that I think set me aside a little bit. I, I, it's it's a skill you need to have as you get bigger. I don't know if everybody's immune to it. Um, also, let's just be very clear: women have it a hundred percent worse. That is an yeah, entire good, good to mention. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know, men have it one way, but but women get a whole another genre of it that we don't need to. You know, we can keep it at that. Um, and I'm sure people know what exactly we're talking about. So uh, it's always made me laugh. Uh, I've never. I, I I've I, I've I only received death threats in the whole cheating. Oh my god! I don't even want to like. Yeah, yeah, we we don't have to. But um, I've never I've never gotten like any anything like to that extent. But I, I, you know, I, I get my hate, and like I said, most of it is kind of that is that my my content is whatever superficial, or I'm I just yell a lot or something, and I have my Gotham isms. But 
it, it's it's got to either motivate you or, or make you laugh. And I, I don't, I'll, I'm not going to have a burner account where I go at people. I'll have my public account where I go at people. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Um, um, cool. And I should explain, since I cut you off a little bit, th- th- what you're referring to, of course, is a cheating controversy with Dua K- Kaipas. I, of course, interviewed uh, uh, WGM Irene Sukander about it, and Levy's talked about it ad nauseum. But if anyone is wondering what we're talking about, you can look it up and hear about it on many different channels. Um, yeah. Now, Levy, I got a couple more Patreon mailbag questions mm-hmm. for you. Uh, a couple of them we've sort of touched on, but I want to read the questions. We have uh, big fans of yours who reached out, so got to make sure that um, you address them head on. Um, so first question is from Daniel Gell, who recently resubscribed to Patreon. So thank you, Daniel. Much appreciated. Uh, he says, Levy, I think the keys to your success are your entertaining jokes and sarcasm, whether viewers like it or not. Not shying away from controversy and the fact that you're just better at chess than 99% of your viewers, despite what angry commentators might say. During the live coverage of your National Open games, I had to remind people that you didn't have stockfish with you during your games, SMH. That means shake my head for older listeners. Anyway, do you agree and do you have anything to add to your success? P.S. Been subscribed since July 12, 2020. According to XX Luke DE, a peculiarly named website, but confirms that I was an early fan, and he's referring to an early fan of, of yours, of course, Levy. First of all, thank you. You believed in me before I believed in me. <laughs> uh, July 2020, man, that's like I don't know, 20k subs on YouTube. So I listen. Uh, I've got a longtime fan who I actually I met. I, I met him. I met Jake in uh, in Vegas. Uh, his username kind of pink Jake. The Twitch viewers might know who that is, and. Um, he uh, he's active on Twitter. He's active on Twitch, and he he was a YouTube sub when I had like two hundred subs. Wow! I mean, think about that. He Shout yeah, out to Jake, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he I think he subbed to my YouTube to troll me to be like, uh, I gotta you know, this guy's content is is so baby. I gotta I gotta make fun of him and and um, yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Like some some people have stuck around and uh okay. So to to answer uh, this question, yes, we've talked about it a little bit during the show. I definitely thought there was something missing from chess on YouTube and I intended to go, go at it. And I, I don't have, I don't have the bonus of being a, a, a top player that anyone's followed. Right. So, um, Hikaru has the benefit of the fact that he's just a brilliant blitz bullet. I mean, he was number two classical in the world. That's not his focus at the moment. And it's fascinating. And, and he's probably of, of like the top GMs is probably top five who can communicate, laugh. Yeah, uh, of course. You know, for there's, there's, there's a lot of positive things you can say. And I mean, it, the growth of chess wouldn't have been possible unless he started streaming in November, 2018 more actively. So uh, I don't have that. I can't go and play Magnus and beat him. I can't go to a, you know, a week long final in the summer. We're talking about the Magnus Carlsen uh, finals um, summer, 2020. So that I can't do, and I had to. I had to see what I could do with my personality and the fact that I have a history of being a chess teacher, so I can make the concepts more bite sized And uh, yeah, a little bit of sarcasm, uh, or I don't know, maybe more than that. Uh, <laughs> and entertainment, cracking jokes, accents, uh, voice inflections. I have a couple of running inside jokes and things that I say. But I try to mix it up every video so that you want to watch. You don't know what you're going to miss in 30 minutes. You don't know how I'll make you laugh or uh, what 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 joke that I'll crack. You'd be like, what? Um, but I, I also try to keep it family friendly because parents watch with their kids, sons, daughters. Like it, it, it they, they 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 watch uh, and they they it's it's a it's a family experience. Also on my on my YouTube, the guess the Elo not always. There's some a little bit of swearing, but uh, and. Uh, I think I can't really add a, a whole lot more, but um, that was a long question. I feel like I'm missing a part of it. There was I something that I asked in the beginning because because we had already um, we had already touched on it. So I I think you got the the broader points. So uh, let's get to the next and last uh, Patreon question, which. I'm guessing is th- some version of this is probably the question you get asked the most. And we even talked about it uh, in, in our prior interview, but uh, Tobiah Rex writes in and asks, uh, do you have any recommendations, advice on how to generate new and original chess content for new streamers? So this person is a new streamer trying to get into it. That's my impression. Yeah. Whew. Um, well, it's funny because a year ago you asked me advice for new streamers and I said, don't do it. Uh, exactly, and here we yeah. are 13, 
here we are 13 months later. That was not strategically me trying to sabotage future competition. I mean, it's just, it's really hard. A lot of people have started streaming chess, literally, and a lot of them are grandmasters. If you ever dig through the chess category, you will be shocked at how many really strong grandmasters are streaming to three viewers, five yeah. viewers. Uh, be entertaining. Have a really good looking stream. So this is this I can safely say. I rate a lot of small creators. If you don't have a camera and it doesn't look good, it doesn't sound good, I'm not bringing my people just because they're going to leave. I'm not bringing it because I don't like it. It's, they're coming from a place where they have music. They have the active chat. They have... They need something where they can feel like they're part of a, a living room experience. You have a big living room. You're having a, a get together. People are drinking. If they're not of age, they're drinking juice. Um, <laughs> they're having a good time. They're socializing chess, whatever. If you have none of those components, it's really hard to, to, to build anything and, and, and be consistent. Now you say, well, the Minecraft people are faceless. Yeah, but that Minecraft is an outlier of epic proportions in terms of... Um, in terms of community and and and, and social media reach, so y- y- everything's got to look good. It's all got to look good. It's got to sound good. Uh, having said that, do it mindfully and with a budget. Don't quit your day job and drop ten grand on a stream setup. I've got thirty dollar monitors. The most expensive thing I have is this Sony camera. My mic is like a hundred bucks. I don't have. I don't even have the Shure, which you have. A lot of yeah. people have the Shure. Um, I didn't get it because I was too lazy to set up the sound dock. I just have a standing microphone and it doesn't yeah. sound so bad. Um, that sounds so, fine, yeah. And then you have to have something compelling about you. Uh, if for whatever reason you have a grandmaster listening right now, uh, be a grandmaster, but be compelling. Make jokes. Uh, make people want to come back. So if they have a favorite big streamer, you can be their favorite small streamer. Uh, or do something cool like adult improver and uh, – Stream yourself training. A lot of people are going to get along with you and want to train with you because a lot of people are currently stuck in the exact same journey. So uh, you got to you gotta turn heads and you got to want people to stay. That's the way you have to think about it. And if you've got to be a little bit more theatrical uh, without being overly fake about it, just understand that if you're going to, if you're going to boot up a camera and just talk like it's nothing, so are hundreds of people. So you need to find something about yourself that stands out. Uh, and if you can't, then do it for fun. Don't make it a career. But if you're trying to make it a career, that might not be, that just might not be feasible because there's truly hundreds of people trying to go at it right now. But I dig around on YouTube all the time. Uh, I dig around on YouTube all the time for, for, for these small channels and interesting stuff that they're doing. And, um, for those of you asking, uh, and, and other people curious how to come up with new ideas. The answer is in the question. Sit around and come up with new ideas. Hey, is there a YouTube video out on this? Look it up. Oh, there is, but it's by a small channel. It hasn't been made by a god, Gotham, Hikaru, <laughs> Danny King, John Bartholomew, right? Like, I, I got Kasparov versus the world. I always knew that was a game, but he, uh, Antonio never made a video about it. <laughs> okay, great. And I made the thumbnail, and I try to make all my thumbnails unique. And um, now it's there, and I don't know, six, seven hundred thousand views. So that's that's the way you got to do it. Like I thought of an idea yesterday. I'm not going to share it. <laughs> You'll have to see it on YouTube. But uh, that's just the way it works. You just sit, brainstorm, think of the thumbnail, and then make the content. And you have to have good thumbnails if you're going to go on YouTube. Twitch is different, but YouTube got to be attention grabbing with the title, the thumbnail, everything. All right, excellent advice. And Levy, uh, do you have influences, like uh, inspirations outside of chess, other content creators that you uh, adapt chess to? Uh, so I only watch two things on screens, really. I, I watch uh, mixed martial arts events when they're there, and I watch a little bit of like uh, basketball news and mixed martial arts news on YouTube. I'll watch my Chael Sonnen, my Undisputed, something about these sports talk shows where the guys yell at each other for 10 minutes uh that's really that's really all i watch i i don't watch a whole lot of shows i'll put that on as background noise uh and i i will say that one i have a very famous moment in my in my twitch stream for me personally this wasn't some sort of big event but somebody told me to make a video about the chess titles and I said, I don't want to make my YouTube videos like Wikipedia. Like, if you can look it up, I don't want to make a video about it. And Tirzu, who I met in person, Tirzu is the guy that makes the tier list videos, the really kind of video game infused with sound effects and like very like high quality production videos on, on YouTube. He said, dude, my entire channel is basically that. 
it's kind of what he said. He's like, you know, I, I, I make bird tier lists, but if you really wanted to go read about birds, you could go read about birds, but it's much better to get it in a 20 minute fun edited video. It's more, more interesting. You can learn and enjoy. And I said, well, okay. So I made the video, how to become a chess grandmaster. Uh, do as I say, not as I do. Mm-hmm. And I told people about the titles and that video does well. Actually, Mr. Beast was on a call with me and told me that he, that was one of the videos of mine that he saw when we were doing a little bit of uh preparation for for pog champs and for those that don't know mr beast i think is currently the most watched youtuber his content is incredibly uh (laughs) explosive he does all sorts of insane expensive stunts and gives away tons of money and uh that's a cool system because he makes a lot on his monetization and he gives away a lot and a lot of people are winners in that case so uh, he told me one thing. He said that every second of your video needs to be compelling and I should consider to edit my chess content a little bit more. Um, so I started editing and doing a little bit more jump cuts, but there's only so much editing you can make on a chess video. Uh, so that's one thing I try to do. I tried there mm-hmm. for there not to be any boring seconds. Do you do that intervals. yourself, Levy? Yeah, it's not that hard. I mean, I have shortcut. It's a free program. I cut certain parts in my intro to make it flow better and that's it. Yeah, it doesn't take a whole lot of work, but um, yeah, I edit most of my own stuff. If it's like super complex, I'll outsource it. Shout out to Daily Dose of Chess. Go cool. subscribe to him on YouTube. But yeah, I would say Tier Zoo, cool. Mr. Beast. Other than that, not not really. Just I don't want to be the second anybody else. I want to be the first Gotham. So nice. Yeah, and Mr. Beast, such a famous YouTube creator that even I've heard of him. Um, and you know, you did a you did a Twitch stream with Gordon Hayward. Obviously, you've done some stuff in, yeah, in collaboration <laughs> with uh, with Chess.com. What other like uh, celebrity brushes have you had, Levy? Like whether it be uh, for a sort of sanctioned thing, like uh, PogChamps, or just sort of uh, less less high profile, less uh, visible, I guess you could say. So I really want to get George St. Pierre to play chess, the MMA uh, goat, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, there was a video that he said that he played chess in his childhood, actually. He competed in some tournaments. I did send him an Instagram DM just for just for kicks. I haven't really messaged a lot of celebrities. It would be cool to do another NBA thing. The Gordon Hayward thing was nuts. I was walking in a botanical garden with my girlfriend and some friends, and I got a notification that Gordon Hayward PayPal'd me money for my wow. course. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is funny. This isn't Gordon Hayward, obviously. And it 100% was Gordon Hayward. I was like, what? And uh, yeah, sometimes I keep track of his chess.com and see how he's doing. And it's uh, that's that that was crazy that we did that lesson. He plays for Charlotte now, Boston previously, and then Utah before that, if anybody follows the NBA. Uh, I actually, um, there is one sports organization, eSports Org, uh, from New York that's b- based in New York called Anbox. And... Uh, I I was hoping that maybe there would be some ability to sign with them. I'm not signed to anybody and I'm happy the way I am, but obviously Yeah, that's crazy though. I mean Well, I don't know, maybe I'm a brand risk. I don't know. I should <laughs> I should I should tweet less about politics. Yeah, we'll uh, get to that. <laughs> but uh yeah, I mean like for example, like they're really they're they're, they're great because they have a lot of roots in New York City and sports teams and I would love to do like a chess event at a big stadium or something like that. It's always some stuff that I'm brainstorming and um, but not, not, no, no real other celebrity run-ins. I've been recognized in New York like eight times. That's pretty cool. That's pretty nice. cool. Um, yeah, yeah but- I wondered about that. And I, and I got to ask you, Joe, I mean, <laughs> Levy, um, <laughs> well, you'll see why I called you Joe in a second. Um, there's this famous sports writer, Joe Posnanski. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's coming on the show, knock on wood, uh, interviewing him later this week, but you, you're a young man, so you may not be that familiar with him. But do, I saw you follow him. Do you are, are you familiar with his work? Probably not to the extent that I should be, but I did notice that some time ago, <clears throat> um, something chess related happened, and he was involved. And then obviously he posted the "I hate chess," and I totally echo his sentiments. Cool. Yeah, that's why. I, that's when I reached out to him. I was like, oh, I, I got to try to get him talking chess. Um, he uh, he he was in my. I think he was in my stream. He might have even given some subs. So yeah, I I like baseball. I've been a Yankee fan since childhood. So uh, I like it less than some of the other sports I watch now. But yeah, I know I, I know of him and I know of his piece. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Just checking in. All right. So Levy, uh, just got a couple more topics I want to hit. But first, let's take one more break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. If you haven't checked out aimchess.com by now, what are you waiting for? 
What Aim Chess does is it collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you actionable advice of how to improve your game. It might be to work on a specific opening or to get better at end games or improve your time management or whatever it may be. And then it gives you related puzzles to help you improve that specific skill. They are constantly improving the site. They recently added blindfold tactics, time management training, common checkmate patterns. So there's so much to do there. If you decide to subscribe, be sure to use the promo code PERPETUAL30. Details are in the show notes for aimchess.com. And we are back. So, Levy, if I told you I was going to ask you about one of your tweets, which one might you think it is? Any guesses? Is it my recent one about anti-vaxxing? <laughs> I've, I've written a lot of political tweets. Yeah, that one was second on the list. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> it is. Uh, I'll read it to you. Um, May 11th, 2021, the biggest... A-holes in chess are rated 2,000 to 2,200. They are strong enough to backseat streamers learning, complain about the influx of new players and gatekeep, which content on YouTube is good and bad, all while being resentful a seven-year-old can beat them despite decades of work. Yeah. So any regrets there, Levy? <laughs> no. Uh, no regrets. Um, we talked about this earlier. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways to start this and kind of go through this. Uh... This mostly comes, I would say, I, I must have seen something that day that, that kind of put me over the top with this. Uh, I think my my biggest, I, I don't know, I, I want to find a better word than hater because it's just such a, such a, you know, bad term. But okay, haters, like the people that, that really, like I said, publicly are like trashing the content and gatekeeping the content uh, are, are about that maybe 18, 1900, 2000, whatever, and, and, and kind of into that master category. Uh, there is a very high chance that on Reddit chess, if someone is, 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 is writing these long thesis statements about why my content is actually bad and I am not the fastest growing YouTuber, they're around that. They have a little tagline that says 2300 Lee Chess, 2100, you know, chess.com rapid or something. And that is because at that level, you you get chess. Like, let me be very clear. I know my tweet said what it said, but you, you get chess more or less. So you still have a long way to go. You are still uh, a, a peon compared to some of the maybe IMs and GMs, maybe not myself, but like a Tuan Min Lei, who's one of the strongest IMs in the world. But they are the best in the room very frequently. And a lot of the comments that they write might be positive, but at the same time, more often than not, a lot of their stuff is like, you should not watch that because that's not how you actually get better at chess. You got to watch this. And uh, that's not the way you should study. This is the way you should study. And I, it, I just, it, it boiled over that day. Like it, <laughs> it boiled over that day. And um, I always say on Twitch and on Twitter, I might be a little bit more theatrical just for a little bit more engagement. Um, but yeah, I mean, your average talented eight-year-old, nine-year-old is now 2000. I mean, if you're not Abhimanyu Mishra and the youngest I am in the world at 10, are you even a prodigy anymore? So that, that tweet was definitely, uh, pointed, uh, so it could get reshared and people would say, oh, Gotham is always dividing the community or, you know, yeah, I, you, definitely, I, I, you definitely made a few enemies with that one. <laughs> yes. Um, and, uh, but that that that's 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 the look that's that's unfortunately the 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 reality i mean i've had the probably the most nasty things said about me or to me directly in some of these like online threads by by folks who can't watch my youtube and learn and they're like oh this guy's such a clown he's such a you know he belongs in a circus i'm going to go watch my 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 power play chess my danny king who's absolutely fantastic but he's a very you know he's a very stoic grandmaster 30 minutes of truly like very high level analysis i love his videos yeah yeah like I, i'm totally giving the man props just as a beginner you can only pay attention to chess like truly and 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 get like the most out of a viewing experience in like you know that sports center format for example and maybe you like like we said the entertainment or the sarcasm or 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 whatever it is it's just two totally different flavors but yeah that day i just decided to come for the the 2k to 2200 oh. out yeah <laughs> but, right. well no i was just gonna add one more thing like a lot of people if you notice a lot of people in those things compared to vid certain video games you have the people who are right there they are right on the cusp of mastery in a lot of video games but they can't go pro or they can't get the teaching job or 
so they're, you know, they're sort of there like, well, I got to take that next step, but I can't quite do it. And uh, by the way, I quit chess for three years from 12 to 15 and I was rated 2000. It's a very hard level of chess to improve. Uh, and sometimes you, 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 you might feel stuck and, and you might get in there. And, um, but I still completely agree with what I said. And, um, you know, I'm, Okay. Well, this is what I'll say. <laughs> First of all, I consider myself in that category. My USCF has been over 2200, but it no longer is. Um, but I wasn't personally offended because I've, I've seen what you're talking about. Um, there, there is a sort of know-it-all strain among some chess fans. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't if I, had I been you, I wouldn't have assigned a specific rating range to it. Um, I think that's where, that's where, uh, as you say, some people felt like you, you know, you're dividing the community by like, if you just said some chess fans are know-it-alls, like, you know, no specific chess fan can feel seen, you know, can, yeah. can, can feel singled out. So I think that's what kind of, uh, got you in some trouble, but honestly, I just, I just can't take this stuff too seriously is the, the main reason it, it didn't upset me, but I did see more vitriol than usual. I mean, I guess I don't read like your, your anti-vaxxer com. I, I can't read anti-vaxxer comments. So, um, I wouldn't know how it compares to the other sort of blowback you've gotten, but it, from my perspective, it seemed, uh, seemed, uh, pretty fierce. Yeah. I, uh, there's definitely the, the folks that are on most of my con like tweets that get attention like that, but they don't follow me, but they always find their way there. Right. Uh, I won't name names. I, I get paid to promote products and people. So uh, I don't, I don't want to give them too much unnecessary attention, but yeah, there's, there's definitely uh, those folks, but yeah, like at the end of the day, Ben, that, that tweet was not out of a place of pure anger. I mean, it was just to crack some people up ultimately. Yeah. Like, Oh, really? That was, yeah, really? Uh, and, and I could have maybe posted some sort of evidence, but definitely yeah, people took it very seriously. They were like, oh, Gotham, the, the ever divisive member of the community and, and, and everything. But listen, we got no other people like that in chess. No grandmasters are ever going to tweet something like that. All the other creators barely tweet that they got the vaccine. So I don't know. People are very uh, walking on eggshells in, in our very much walking on eggshells. You, in and, Feingold, you and Feingold carry the torch. Uh, that's about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. If, I don't even know if Ben's tweeted something like that. Um, yeah, Dan, Ben is definitely a much more makes a lot more, I think, political statements uh, than myself. He's, he's <laughs> he 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 uh, he definitely doesn't hide it, and I, and I and I respect that about him. Um, and I, I think I've tweeted enough about politics, and I've spoken about uh, politics on on Twitch. I actually don't think I'm. I would probably surprise some people actually with the way I talk about it, that I'm not like leading so far one way or the other. But uh, I think that there is less politics and more common sense problems, particularly in the States. So that is the stuff that I, I speak out against and, or for. And I got to ask Levy, because it's it's unclear. I mean, you're so popular that maybe it is good for your, your air quotes brand, but do, is there even a voice in your head? I mean, clearly you're kind of like a no filter type of guy, but do you kind of like have to force yourself to say, say something incendiary on, on stream or like hit send on that tweet? Or is it just like, you think it, you send it, boom. Okay. I mean, I definitely have, I've, I've stopped myself from tweeting certain things. Uh, right before we went live, I saw a cop in Arkansas killed a kid at three in the morning. Um, and you know, guy was a, a white teenager. And I, and I, and I say that's actually kind of important because it, it, it's, it's, it's always, it's always not that right. And, and then the argument is that, Oh, it doesn't make the news. Like somehow, uh, the, you know, um, people who are, are Republican will be like, Oh, this is only news because this, I mean, they, they still, right. So without making this podcast political, I saw that there was a story. It was a white teenager. It's, you know, he was on his little ATV took out some anti-freeze to put it behind his tire so that the thing wouldn't roll into the cop car, got shot in the neck. I want to tweet about this stuff all the time, Ben. I think there are so many fundamental problems with this country and like we really need to work on them and fix them. And sometimes I'm, I don't, I don't do it because I, I give up. I have like mm -hmm. no hope that we're actually going to fix any of this stuff. Um, I would tweet something political every day, multiple day, m multiple times, um, you know, multiple times a, uh, a day, but uh, I'm wary of a couple of things. So first of all, uh, I am wary of uh, getting too involved in this hateful world of, po of politics. I'm, I'm, air, I'm air quoting on my camera, but you know, uh, like I said, common sense. And then people will get weaponized with it and 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 hunt down where I where where my family lives or where I live or something like that. 
Uh, but it it it's a little bit too hateful for me. Um, and also, I mean, frankly, cancel culture. Like, if I say yeah. something even half wrong, you got to be like, you got to be really careful. And 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 I I I don't hold any views. Like, let's let me just be very clear. I don't hold any views that like I'm hiding and they could get me canceled. Like, no, I'm I'm a normal common sense kind of guy. But if I ever spoke out about like some sort of moderate territory where I'm not leaning one way or the other, you never know. I mean, you really, you really, and I, and I, and I, I don't want to run that risk. I don't want to say something wrong. And then I have to come out here with YouTube apologies or Twitter apologies or, uh, Ben Johnson podcast. Apologies. <laughs> like, hey, You're always uh, welcome, man. <laughs> no matter so, how bad you screw up. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things. So I, I, I tend to keep it to things like, uh, gun violence in America is disgusting and we're the laughing stock of the entire world. And if there's any Americans who are listening, offended by that statement, I'm sorry. That's the, that is like the truth. I mean, it, I got a lot of European viewers who always make fun of me because they're like, dude, what is going on there? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's like that stuff like that. And yeah, the anti-vaxxer stuff. I just, I love I love it. It's, I mean, like the people, bring it on, yeah. yeah, because the people in the comments who are like, oh, it's, it's, it's so bad, Ben. I mean, we're not going to beat the Delta and the Lambda variants without, without getting stabbed in the arm. So yeah. it's, uh, and I'm not a doctor, obviously I'm not a doctor and we'll, we'll, you know, more things will come out about side effects. I just think, I just think, I just think it's so funny. That's yeah. okay. But that's well, just, <laughs> That's just me. A slightly less controversial topic, I hope. Um, one thing I, I really appreciate about you, and I mentioned this to uh, Patreon subs when I announced the, the second interview, because again, like, I can see how people got upset about your, uh, your, um, your tweet about the people rated 2000 to 2200. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm <clears throat> anti, anti-vaxxer, but I can see how people on the right might, you know, have some they might disagree with you on some issues and so, and in some cases um it's it's totally understandable to me but the fact that you stand up for women in chess to me is quite it's full stop <clears throat> admirable especially like someone of of your um of your station now um so like maybe i don't know how you want to approach this maybe the the <clears throat> feedback that your girlfriend Lucy gets um maybe you know I know you donated to US Chess Women like how has this issue come to your attention as as a male sure well that's there's obviously the the women in chess and just women period um I can say that at at no point in my life did somebody sit me down and go uh the world is you know like destroy the patriarchy you have to be nicer to women like no one ever sat me I just that's just common sense. Like I said, like with some of my political views, it just seems like common sense to me. You're just all human. Like, why, like why, why do we need these like mini lectures? I mean, some of us do. Absolutely. I, I just, I, I, I never had that. And I would say that, <clears throat> um, let's see women, women in chess. That's, uh, that probably became very much at, at the center of attention when I became a chess teacher. So I, uh, I had a I had a girl show up my first day on the job of the school that I ran the program at for multiple years before I went full time content creation. A second grade girl, class of first, second, third grade boys, and uh, she was like crying because she was the only girl. It was like mm-hmm. her and like fifteen really rowdy kids punching each other, biting each other, yelling at each. These are Brooklyn kids. I mean, they're private school kids, but like they're Brooklyn kids. If they were Manhattan private school kids, they wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> um, my New Yorkers know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> no, no, it's good. I'm mm-hmm. saying I, I, I'm, I, I'm firing shots at Manhattan. Kids getting picked up in bulletproof Mercedes Benzes <laughs> in Manhattan, man. Like, I mean, like we're talking. It's a totally different ball game. I really enjoyed being a chess teacher in Brooklyn, actually, um, even for the wealthiest of families because they, they're a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> that's a separate talking point. So. Uh, yeah, that's that's when it became quite clear to me, and I think there was one article that went around of of a, of a school that got featured in uh, in like the New York Times or one of these things that they did really well at the state championship. Uh, and uh, 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 I actually think that same girl's mom responded to this thread like, "I don't think they mentioned a single girl in that article." And that was a team of like 30, 40 kids, and that might have been very well true. We had very famously on our team. 
40 competitive players and four of them were girls. And that was actually successful. One out of 10 for, 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 for most chess programs. But when I left, we made a big push to have an all girls class. And I, and I know there's an entirely separate debate about all girls classes, but the truth is, and for some people, this is for some reason uncomfortable to talk about. Like there are just fundamental differences between boys and girls, even at a young age, particularly in the classroom. Boys would much rather get into arguments and beat each other up. It's just true. I've been around hundreds of them, <laughs> like hundreds of students. And if you make an all-girls chess classroom and they're all focused and they don't have that distraction, a lot of them like have a really nice incubated learning experience. They get along great. The older the older kids help the younger kids, and you know now we're now now before i left that that program more girls were playing chess in kindergarten than boys that's great like yeah that, that's that's crazy now of course you would need to then figure out at what point if at any point does that trail off when do the boys get more serious about it when does it right there's social dynamics i mean people want to make arguments for hormonal dy- dynamics like like both genders hit puberty totally differently i don't know i'm i'm not a scientist i'm just here to report that at a very young age, given the right learning experience, the best learning experience in the classroom, girls play chess b- by more numbers and more competitively than boys. That's that's before I left as a as as a teacher, we had that. Like we 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 found that, we discovered it. Um and whatever happens beyond that point has to do with society, has to do with, like I said, just just the fundamental differences between the two. I mean, I that's that's the facts as as I can report them. However, um, yeah, men are just terrible to women. And for those listening who are like, I'm not, yes, I understand. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who are, man. Like they, 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 there just aren't, I don't, I don't know where that comes from. Like, I don't know where it, it's, it's even the smallest of things, like not understanding that, that, that the conversation is over and you're making someone feel uncomfortable to, to the, the, obviously just the people that just do all the gross stuff. Um, and, and, uh, and like we were talking earlier about female content creators and all the comments that they have to deal with, uh, it's 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 really it's really rough. And like the Botes sisters, um, Nemo, Anna Kramling, Anna Rudolph, they all they all talk about it, but the men don't like at all. And I I, I don't really know why they don't. Maybe like a guy like Eric Rosen is just non controversial. Period on on any subject, and he'll obviously speak out about something like this, but. Yeah, I'm very on the nose with it. I will screenshot a YouTube comment, as you've seen me uh, do, and just post it on Twitter and be like, don't be like this person. And if you have a friend who's like this person, stop them. Yeah. You know, because you can make as many jokes as you want behind the scenes, but that that might spill over into into whatever, into the uh, your, your, your job or the way you interact with people. And and truthfully, if you're if you're like hateful, then nowadays a text message or a post you made on any platform many years ago will potentially lose you your job. And I don't necessarily agree with the way the world is now in in that regard, but that's just the truth. Like you got to just treat people with respect. <laughs> like my whole thing is, I'll treat anybody with respect as long as whatever they do doesn't affect me, my family, my loved ones detrimentally. Like go and live your best life, whatever. Uh, in whatever way you wish. And, and, and I just, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why we, we say like nasty comments to uh, adults, but even, even, you know, like I've been, I've been at chess tournaments and a girl who's like five will beat an older guy. And the guy will like sit there holding her hand after the handshake for a minute, trying to talk to her and like give her advice. It's like the creepiest like thing ever. Yeah. And I didn't know, like, am I supposed to step in? Like, I, I don't know. It's, you know, maybe it's innocent. The guy's just a bit weird, but it's the only sport in the world that pits potentially a tiny girl against an older an older guy who's you know who's who doesn't have like the best intentions. I mean, it, it really is, and I don't know. That was a that was a very long drawn no. out monologue, but I mean, I try to draw as much attention to it as possible, man. Not just in chess and society. Like we just got to be better, and we are better than we yeah. were, but. I appreciate it. Yeah, and we are better. It's worth not losing sight of that. And in summation, treat everyone with respect, except people rated between two thousand and twenty two hundred. Right, right, uh, left. No, <laughs> unless they're banned. Unless they're banned. You know, they're. Uh, yeah, if they're, if they're gatekeeping what you should and shouldn't watch on YouTube, you should probably stay away. Um, so, but other other than that, yeah, it's you, you gotta. I I I think we can bridge the gap. Um, and uh, I I I think we can totally have more more Judith Polgars, but. Yeah, that That's would be yet awesome. to be seen. 
what a beast. Um, all right, last topic. I think Levy, we got to get an update on uh, Lucy's chess game. How's uh, how's how's her game? How's your girlfriend's game progressing? Uh, great. For the amount of study that that uh, Lucy puts into chess, which is virtually none. Um, <laughs> love you if you're listening. Um, she she's actually she's progressed quite well. So she she had an interesting journey. She learned chess uh, after we started uh, dating. She didn't play a whole lot. She mostly played ten minute games per coach's orders. You know you got to play slow games. Uh, and she learned some openings here and there. We messed around with different openings with white and black. Uh, but then you know Lu, Lu, Lucy really she hates losing. Everybody hates losing, right? But uh, she a few months ago was like, "Why am I playing ten minute games?" And they make me even angrier because I spend so much time trying to think and focus and I either run out of time after I play well or I, I you know, like I, uh, I run it yeah. or, or like you spend 20 minutes and you blunder your queen or something. Like, why did I even? Start? So she started playing three minute chess, which is a totally different universe. But she climbed the rank. She was like 600, slowly got to seven, bounced around eight, nine. And I think she went to like 990. Just playing on, you know, instinct, and and I've seen her play some crazy games, and now she's got the ladder anxiety where she's like, oh my god, I'm playing the four digit people, <laughs> and like a couple of weeks ago she beat like a one thousand fifty with two seconds on the clock versus like a minute in like a ladder mate, it was crazy, and she's played like some really good games, um, but uh, I don't think she's in love with chess to the point that she will diligently study it and try to like go up a hundred points like every every few weeks, but uh, I love watching her games. I like to analyze them with her. And uh, we'll both throw our phone once every week, maybe from, you know, losing. She'll, she'll blunder something. I'll lose a time scramble versus like a 2400. So and phone gets thrown. I try to always throw it at something soft. I'm going to throw my phone. <laughs> but chess rage is a thing, man. Totally. Yeah, so I'm with you, man. <laughs> it's like, and I don't know. I don't know about you, but I can have a, I, I, I'm at a point in my life where I can have like chest tilt, blitz tilt and like, compartmentalize it you you know go through your life do your work stuff do your family stuff and then you set the computer boom rage you know <laughs> like it's unique in that way it's it's the worst it's <laughs> oh my god but it's also the best because we keep yeah. coming back yeah well said all right actually i thought of one more question levy obviously you've had a lot of success in the last year um any big purchases or is it just 100 percent same old same old oh that's a good question um, yeah, what is the most expensive thing? Okay. So first of all, you make money, you got to invest money, people, uh, got to invest money. I don't invest like me. I, I, I go into crypto. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to, I try to, so I have, um, I have some ETFs. Uh, I have, uh, some stocks that I believe in kind of more long-term. I have my meme stocks, my GameStop, my AMC, you know, nice. my, my uh yeah my 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 pump and dump or short squeeze stocks yes yeah. exactly um big on you know some of the cryptos uh trying to get a little bit more into like uh, angel investing so i've i've tried to it, for me the the hardest thing is i don't know a lot of people so it's really hard to tap into networks of where people are investing especially like as angels or vcs but i i, I tried my best uh I would love to get a car so i really do want to get like a a fun convertible bmw and the problem is I live in New York City and I don't go anywhere. So <laughs> why am I why am I going to park a nice BMW on the streets of New York City? I don't even have a garage. Like I'm moving buildings and I don't have uh, I don't even have a driveway. Yeah. Um. So I like to. I think the most expensive stuff that I've gotten is I've I've spent money on uh on Lucy. So she got like a cool tattoo. Um, I got her I got her a nice dress and I wanted to get a nice shirt to match it. Um, we got the most expensive thing we bought was something from Versace and my thing came three sizes too big and I missed the return period. So now I'm going to look like, you know, a monk wearing my, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think, I don't think that was the most expensive, but over the past, yeah, over the past year, I mean, investing mostly, I mean, I upgraded my camera. Uh, the next place will be bigger. The next apartment will be bigger, but even then we tried to kind of stay in budget uh, Are you still gonna have roommates? No, we've no. I've lived with Lucy, and that's it. So we oh, we okay. have a uh, no roommates. Um, more space might like uh might 
try out some classes that are kind of pricey standard, like uh, kickboxing or some of these things that um, you, you, I'm going to try to like do more one-on-one stuff, which obviously costs a little bit more and try to pay more for like organic food just to eat healthier. But right. yeah, nothing, nothing crazy. You might see me in a convertible BMW. That's it. Okay. And, um, no, and no thoughts of uh, Gotham chess leaving New York. Oh, plenty of thoughts, man. But, <laughs> Every New Yorker um, thinks about it, yeah. Very, very conflicted, man. I, I did those tax calculators on what I can save <laughs> moving to those states. The good thing is that every time I think about Austin, their power grid fails. So, <laughs> and then they 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 permit you to carry a gun without a permit now. Um, that's the only political sprinkle I'll give you. So I don't know about I don't know about Texas anymore. L.A. is beautiful. I, I um, L.A. I I hear amazing things about and the only bad thing about la is number one taxes which you can't scare me with because i'm from new york and number two traffic and i don't drive a lot so i'm not scared of you la nice. uh, but right. of course then taxes are higher so yeah yeah definitely want to leave uh new york but also want to leave the country travel or living want to go want to go uh travel somewhere do it up, man. Make the uh, make the uh, Levy Mania tour global. <laughs> I don't know if I'll go full Logan Paul and do a big fan meetup in Dubai. I, I'm not, I'm not at that level. But hey, hey in the airport. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I did think about that. Uh, but that's still a work in progress. But uh, it's crazy. I I, I got to tell you, it, it is still kind of surreal to to have a person walk up to you in the middle of an airport or on like in the local park and go. Are you Levy? How is that possible, man? Like that is just so. So I made a tweet recently. I said, you can only take a picture with me if I can pet your dog. If you have a I dog. saw that. So, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And sorry, I keep saying one more question, but how does, how's your family reacted to this? Mm, same old, I gotta say, uh, same old. I've offered to pay for some medical bills and some projects. And I, I also told my family, if we ever travel anywhere, we'll all fly first class. That is that is a purchase I haven't made yet, like you said, but that is one thing I want to promise them. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I'm i not going to lie to the audience. This wasn't like a rags to riches story. I had a relatively decent childhood. I had three homes with divorced parents and a grandparents neutral territory in the middle. So it was interesting to go around three houses. Uh, so from that standpoint, but listen, I always had a roof over my head. I had a pretty decent support system. So I uh, want to give back to the family and get them nice things and maybe some beach house somewhere over the course of time. But they're, uh, they're pretty chill. My grandparents said that I should charge for selfies now as a joke. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I don't think if you do that. Yes, of course. No, no, I please, uh, do, do offer pictures. It's funny. I offered one person who was really awkward that ran into me a picture and he said, if you want, I was like, come on, man. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, come on, man. Uh, but no, no, I think family is kind of good. chill about all of it, which is good. Cool. All right. Well, Levy, you've been super generous with your time. I know you say you're not busy, but much appreciated nonetheless. Uh, any Anything you want to throw in before uh, we wrap this up? Uh, train all day. Ben Johnson podcast all night, all day. You know what that is? <laughs> it's Nick Diaz with the intro for Joe Rogan. Yeah, so yeah. You can. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm awesome uh, no, I. Joe Rogan. I yeah, I know the takes and everything, right? You gotta <laughs> you gotta get canceled like once every month. Um, <laughs> that was the, that was actually uh, hilarious. Joe Rogan talked about the Dewa Keepers thing, but like no names, just kind of very uh, uh, on the top for like a couple of minutes in, in like a random episode he did. So that that was pretty crazy. But no, uh, I I love your work, and there there are no chess podcasts and. I uh, want to come on and chat and catch up. And hopefully this will be good for my audience because they don't really hear me talk like this for 90 minutes at a time about different parts of my life. And hopefully this is good exposure and they'll start watching a lot of a lot of your stuff. When are you getting Magnus on? You know, that is a good question. I, I keep checking my phone and the, the messages must be getting lost or something. But um, I think I've said this before. I feel like I, I'm a favorite for it to happen someday, but there, there's, no, there's nothing in the works. Uh, you got to gotta like get to the team or the dad, right? You got to get the Yeah. Henrik. Well, I want to interview his dad anyway. I mean, we talk so much chess improvement that I want to I want to get his story and I think that would be a little easier. So I'll probably probably start that way. Well, 
This was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks a lot, Levy. Um, I think listeners know where to find you, Twitch, uh, <laughs> YouTube, Twitter, et cetera. So uh, we, we'll let you go. Thanks, thanks again, man. Thank and, you. Uh, and congrats on your success. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible, most of all to my producer, Matthew Passy. I also would like to thank everyone who helped spread the word about the show. Did you guys know that there's still people who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast? There's even chess players who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast. So we need to fix that. And the ways to do that include writing positive reviews on podcast platforms or YouTube comments telling friends, all that stuff makes a difference in helping spread the word about the show. But of course, I most of all want to thank people who provide financial support to the show. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. So without further ado, I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, Apprentice Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porteau, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, Chessmood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Heat, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Farhan Thawar, Barasawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, I am Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsythe, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Sell, The King's Crusher YouTube channel, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, The Famous Mr. Dodgy, The Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Grandmaster Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flummins, The Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Ross Crossland, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gerson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Ace Baega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue. Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio K. Leonfort, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard, Lynn, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Chad Hilton, Chess Patser Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotschek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Tennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Melo Padilla, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Francis Latart Lavoir, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Bihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Takumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Joe Dasano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kravutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelyanovas, aka Photo Chess, Mark Shaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovich, 
Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Blaine, Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited of Switzerland, Randall Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Titi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel and publishing empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Kraus, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Sergey McCagan, Seth Ruzica, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatev Abrahamian, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Jivko Stoyanov. Thanks to you all for the support, and we will catch you all next week.